That being said, we'll be in Mark chapter 12. So after taking a little break from the Gospel of Mark in December and in January, we're now returning back to the series and we're going to finish out uh, the Gospel. And so in case you have forgotten what's been going on in the Gospel of Mark, let me refresh you where we've been. Mark has been asking this one question over and over and over again, who is Jesus? It's been this constant drumbeat that keeps coming up, and we get little snippets of the answer here and there. And what we come to find out, the resounding conclusion that we come to find out is that Jesus is the one who has all authority. He's the one who has authority to cast out demons. He's the one who has authority to heal the sick. He is the one who has authority to stop the raging storm, to raise dead people to life, and he is the one who has authority to forgive us of our sins. And finally, Peter makes this great confession in chapter 8 that Jesus is none other than the long-awaited Christ whom all of Israel has been waiting for. And so what we're going to see this morning is that even though Jesus is the Christ, even though Jesus is the one who has all authority, not everyone received Jesus as the Christ and they actually rejected his authority. And so would you please stand with me as I read from Mark chapter 12. We'll be looking in verse 13. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection, and they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. You may be seated, and would you please pray with me? Lord, We have the privilege this morning to come and bless you, not just in this moment, but also at all times. We have great reason to draw near to you in prayer and to bless your name as you have abundantly blessed us. O Lord, your praise will continue to come from our mouths and our souls boast alone in you. Far be it from us to boast in anything except for you, O God. Continue to renew the hearts of your people from the natural heart of stone and give us hearts of flesh. Put the desire in us to seek you while you are near. Help us to believe in your truths and promises when our hearts are prone to unbelief. Strengthen us to pray without ceasing and to love the things of the Spirit and be against the things of this world. O Father, gladden the hearts of your humble people that do not lift themselves up and to seek to make a name for them. Assure them that the glory of your name is the only one worth pursuing because we know that the favor that comes from you is greater than the favor that comes from men. In this plea, we do not come alone. Your people are coming before you together to magnify your name, and this is our prayer together, O God. Our desire is to exalt your name together, even if we were able to praise, bless, and magnify your name together without ceasing, it would still fall far short of the glory and honor due to your name. We praise your name, O Lord. Give us grace now to receive and respond to your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, children, uh, third grade, five through third grade, they can be dismissed to Children's Church. You can make your way over there, excitedly skipping and running. All 
All right, great. So there's this old football drill that we used to do uh, that I now actually think uh, is illegal. Um, we used to do it as kids. Uh, this drill, it was called Bull in the Ring. And what would happen is, is the coach would choose one player and they would put him in the middle and then all of the other players would circle around him. And what would happen is, is the coach would call out a number from a player in the circle and then that player would then go charge as hard and fast as they can to the person uh, in the middle. And the person in the middle would have to meet this player head on and on and on this would go and the coach would keep calling these numbers and sometimes if you were strong enough he would call two numbers at once and you would be up against two guys and basically it was just a, a smashing fest. And the kid who was in the middle would get bragging rights if he completely just destroyed and owned everyone. Needless to say, from that drill, and why I think it's illegal, is there were many kids who walked away injured from that drill. But if you think about it, that's actually sort of what's kind of happening here in our text. Since chapter 11, verse 27, the Sanhedrin, or the ruling authorities of Jesus' time, they were coming to try and trap Jesus and discredit, it and get, discredit him and get rid of him. And so they were coming one right after the other. We keep seeing these people. We keep seeing the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees. We see all of these ruling authorities. We see the scribes. All of these people keep coming up to Jesus and asking him these questions and posing these hypothetical situations, all for the sole reason of trying to discredit him and get rid of his authority. And one by one, Jesus utterly crushes their false assumptions. It's actually really quite remarkable what Jesus does here in our text. He doesn't evade their question. He doesn't ignore their question. He doesn't run away from their question. But he also doesn't speak in a way that traps himself and actually discredits his authority. And as a, as a result, everyone is left speechless and utterly amazed at him. I mean, we read a text like this, or if you're anything like me and you read a text like this, I walk away amazed and I'm thinking, I have no idea how I'd answer that question and get out of that trap, and yet Jesus does it flawlessly. But what happens when we look into our own hearts after reading this text? Do we see some of ourselves in the Pharisees and Herodians? Do we see some of ourselves in the Sadducees? Are there areas in our life that we're actually failing to submit to Jesus' authority? Or are there some of you here this morning who are outright rejecting the Lord and are hostile towards him? I mean, what actually goes wrong if we reject the authority of Jesus? And in a simple way, you're either for Jesus or you're against him. If you don't submit to him now, then there's no way you're going to submit to him when he returns. You're either on this side with Jesus or you're on this side against him. But I want to flesh this out a little more. If you fail to submit to the authority of Jesus well, then you have to submit to the authority of something else. And more likely than not, that other authority is ourselves. We like to be the king of our own little world, and we like to have a say of what goes and what doesn't go in our own little world. If we rebel against the authority of the Lord, then we have no choice but run life our own way without him. And my question for you is, is look around. What do you see? You see that we fail to rule ourselves and society around us. We want to be our own rulers and have authority over the things in our life, and yet, as I've said time and time again, we lose our car keys once a month. What kind of a ruler is that who loses his car keys once a month? We try to exercise our own authority, and we walk away distressed or sad or anxious because we actually don't have the power to change anything. You see, if we reject and rebel against the authority of Jesus, we are actually left with a weak authority, an authority that leaves broken relationships and fails to accomplish what we most deeply desire. And so what are we to do when we come to a text this morning and see that Jesus has all authority? How are we to respond to this? Well, as we're going to see, because Jesus has proven that he does have all authority, we need, <coughs> excuse me, we need to rid ourselves of every temptation to reject his authority by submitting to that authority. And I know that sometimes it seems easier to act as our own authority because there's a part of us that believes that we know best, we want what's best, we deeply desire, we deeply desire what's best. 
But as we notice, Jesus' response actually shatters all of our assumptions about our own authority, revealing that the best thing that we can do in this life is to submit ourselves to Jesus' authority. But why? Why is that? Why do we need to submit ourselves to Jesus' authority? My first point is simply because we belong to God. Look at uh, verse 13. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion if you are not swayed by appearances. But you truly teach the way of God. Here's the question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or to not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why do you put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see it. Whose likeness, whose inscription is on this? Caesar's. Okay, well then render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. When we read this text, when we notice this, right away we notice that something is not quite right. We see that the Pharisees and the Herodians are teaming up to try and trick Jesus. And in this time period, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they didn't mix well together. They weren't the best of friends. The Pharisees were this conservative group theologically. They were considered experts of the law. They were know all things law. They tried to live life by the law. And the Herodians were these people who were associated with power. Think of Herod. And they didn't much agree with the Pharisees on a lot of matters. And yet, here they are, coordinating together against Jesus, teaming up to try and discredit him. And they approach Jesus with this flattery, all right? And they're trying to say, oh, teacher, you show no partiality. You're going to shoot us straight. We're going to ask you a question, and you don't care about anyone's opinion. If they like you, you'll tell them the truth. If they don't like you, they'll tell you the truth. And while what they said is true, they were completely insincere when they came to Jesus. And they only say this because they're trying to trap Jesus and set him up for failure, And the trap that they lay and the question that they ask is actually quite clever. They want him to answer this one question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Yes or no? That's all we want to know. But Jesus immediately sees right through the trap and seeing the hypocrisy. He asks them, why are you putting me to the test? I see what you're trying to do. Why are you doing it? The tax that is in mind here is the poll tax that... um, is the poll tax that they would pay once a year. And if Jesus said yes to paying the poll tax, if he just said, yes, we should pay um, Caesar taxes, well, then he would lose favor with all the people because they hated that tax. And so this poll tax would occur once a year, and they had to pay it because Judea was a vassal state underneath the Roman Empire. Okay? And so if Jesus is saying, yes, give to Caesar what you owe him, then everyone is not going to like him because they didn't like being under Roman authority. I mean, if you look at early Christianity, the Romans persecuted the early church. I'm not saying great things never happened from the Roman Empire, obviously, but in this time period, Christians were persecuted by the Roman authorities. And so if Jesus is saying, hey, give the tax to the Roman authorities, well, then obviously he's going to lose favor with that. All the people are going to reject him and turn away from him. But on the other hand, if Jesus just says, don't pay taxes to Caesar, well then what will happen is is he can be brought before the Roman authorities and he can be arrested. In fact, that's probably why the Herodians were there in the first place. If Jesus says to pay taxes, he would lose favor with the people. But if he says not to pay taxes, then the Herodians would tell Herod and he would be reported to the Roman authorities and arrested and problem solved. It's sort of heads I win, tails you lose kind of situation. Jesus is put in this Uh, impossible situation. He's got a dilemma going on. He's stuck between a rock and a hard place. How do you answer that? Look what Jesus does. He asked to see a denarius. And so a denarius was this silver coin, and it was required to pay this poll tax, and it was about a day's wage for a working man. And on one side of the coin, it would have a picture of Tiberius Caesar with his official title. All right, and so at this time, it was Tiberius Caesar, and what it would say on the coin, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus, in some abbreviated form so it would fit on the coin. And then on the back side, it would say high priest. And so here you have a coin with the emperor on it, with Caesar on it, with his picture that said son of the divine Augustus, and on the back side, it said high priest. 
And immediately, you can understand, begin to understand why the Jews would hate the poll tax, because they were required to pay the poll tax with that silver denarius. It was blasphemy for them to even hold a coin such as that. And so that's what makes this trap so clever and so challenging. But look what Jesus does. He takes the coin, he looks at it, and he asks a simple question. Whose likeness or whose image is on the coin? And the obvious response is Caesar's, which prompts Jesus to say something really amazing. Render to Caesar what is Caesar, and render to God or pay back to God what is God's. This one very small, simple statement has a ton of implications for us, much more than we'll be able to discuss today. But in a word, it has implications for God and for government, for God and for politics. We're getting a Christian view from Jesus on how we are to think about politics. This one statement, render to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's, is telling us to be good citizens even if you think that the government is bad. Jesus says, pay back to Caesar what is his. His image is on it. It's his poll tax. It's his. Pay it back to him. Submit to the government and do your duty as a citizen, even if you think the government's bad. And so we see from the statement that, statement that human government does have legitimate authority, even if it exercises it poorly. But we also notice that allegiance to God and to country aren't inherently incompatible. There are duties to government that don't automatically infringe on our duties to God. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, render to God what is God's. They're not inherently incompatible. I mean, we can go on and on about the implications on this verse about God and government, but here's the main point that I want you to see from this statement. The state is not God. Jesus says to render to God what is God's? We owe our ultimate allegiance to God. I mean, think about the midwives in Exodus 2 when Pharaoh told them to kill off all the Israelite babies. Their ultimate allegiance was to God. Even if this government said to do this, their ultimate allegiance was to God. Or think about Peter in the book of Acts when he's brought before the ruling council. And Peter's response says, you can do what you want to me, but I'm still going to pre preach Christ and him crucified. Or think about Daniel in Babylon. He prays against Nebuchadnezzar. Our ultimate allegiance is to God. And in a beautiful display of wisdom, Jesus doesn't just outright say, yes, pay taxes, or no, don't pay taxes. He says, whose image is on the coin? Well, it's Caesar's. Okay, well, then it's his. Pay it back. Give it back to him. But here's the implication, here's the implication that I want you to see. Whose image is on you. The Greek word that's used here in this text is the same word that we see in the Greek Old Testament when it comes to Genesis 126, when God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Caesar's face is stamped on the coin, but God's face is stamped on you. If you were to pay a coin back, because it belongs to Caesar, then what are you to pay back to God? Your very self. You belong to God. The Heidelberg Catechism question number one asks this, what is your only comfort in life and death? And the answer is that I'm not my own, but belong, both body and soul, in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, God has a right to all of you because you are made in his image. His face is engraved upon every single heart. And if that's true, then Jesus has a right to all of you, who is God. If it's a sin to withhold your taxes to the U.S. government or to the Roman authorities, then how much greater of a sin is it to withhold anything from the one who made you, from the king of the universe, the one whose image is stamped upon you? Don't miss this point. We must resist every temptation to reject Jesus' authority by submitting to his authority 
because we belong to him. We were created to submit to him. But what does that actually look like? To give our everything to Jesus, to submit all of ourselves to him, to give over our very lives. Well, I want to answer that by showing you what we don't do. Sometimes to get a clearer picture of something, I think it's good to explain the negative side of what not to do rather than saying what we should do. All right? And actually, the Sadducees help us illustrate this point quite clearly. And so look at verse 18. And the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. And then the wife died. The woman also died. And the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. Again, look at Jesus' response. Jesus said to him, Is this not the reason that you are wrong? Because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. The Sadducees were connected with the priestly family, all right? and they're only mentioned here in the Gospel of Mark at this time. The Pharisees and the Herodians pose this political question to Jesus to try and trap him. The Sadducees then come and pose a purely theological question uh, to trap him. And at the heart of their theological worldview, there was a denial of the resurrection. The Sadducees also at the heart of their worldview, they gave supremacy to the Torah or the first five books of the Bible. And so they basically rejected all of the prophets and all of the oral traditions, which include a lot about the afterlife and include a lot about the resurrection. And so for the Sadducees, if the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, were their supreme authority, the scriptures that they held to, they argued that there wasn't much to be said in the first five books of the Bible about the resurrection. And so at first glance, when we're reading this, you may actually wonder what's going on. And yet, it's another brilliant test that was intended to discredit Jesus based on this concept of what they called a levirate marriage. And so in essence, if a husband died, then it was common law that his brother would marry the wife and then raise up children in his brother's name. All right? And so the Sadducees' hope was that if Jesus believed in a resurrection, then they would make him look silly with this crazy scenario of a woman who was married to seven brothers. And so their hope is that if Jesus actually believes this resurrection stuff, okay, we're going to pose this crazy question and try and discredit him. All right, and make him look silly, thus losing favor with all of the people. But on the other hand, in order for Jesus to get out of the situation in their minds then he would have to deny the resurrection, and then he would lose favor with all the people for believing in an afterlife and a resurrection. Again, stuck between a rock and a hard place. And so here again, Jesus responds with amazing wisdom. He goes right after their faulty assumptions and says that the reason for their error is that they know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And that's it. You know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Much of our misunderstanding in life about God, people, life, it comes from a lack of knowledge of the scriptures. The Sadducees argue on a doctrine that they don't even believe in that stems from a Bible that they don't even know. How much of our misunderstanding about God stems from biblical illiteracy? How quick are we to put other things above the scriptures? Even good things. How often do we go to a book to find answers? How often do we rely on the catechism questions or creeds or confessions? All good things. But all of these things must be under the authority of Scripture. Or how often do we let other things inform our view of the world rather than the Bible? I mean, think about the shows that we watch. Think about the articles we read. Think about the blogs that we go to. Think about the conversations that we have. I mean, the Bible doesn't speak to every single issue that we face in our day, but it must be the starting point for everything that we come across rather than the other way around. How often do we start with some topic or some theme or some issue or idea and make the Bible conform to it rather than starting with 
the Bible in conforming our thoughts and ideas around what Scripture has to say. I mean, in our culture today, we are confronted with a host of issues. And some of us may be struggling to know how to live in a way that pleases the Lord and reflects his submission to his authority. A study from Ligonier Ministries and Lifeway from 2020 shows that 30% of evangelicals reject the deity of Christ. 46% 46% that believe, 46% believe that people are good by nature. And 22% think that gender identity is a matter of personal choice. I mean, this is alarming for many reasons, but what's most alarming is that it stems from a lack of biblical knowledge, and it's these stats that are coming from within the church. People who come week in and week out and still struggling to know how to think through these issues. I mean, again, there's much more that we can say about theology and biblical illiteracy from this text, more than we have time to actually uh, discuss. But here's the point I'm making. If we belong to God, and we must submit to the authority of Jesus, one of the ways that we fail to do that is a lack of knowledge of the scriptures that testify to the very one we are supposed to submit to. Let me illustrate it this way. In one of Kelly's former jobs, she had a supervisor who didn't communicate anything to her, right? So she would show up to work, and her supervisor didn't set clear expectations, um, didn't communicate on a regular basis, and so Kelly would go in day after day, and she would have to guess what her supervisor wanted, and she was never really sure if she was doing the job adequately or not, and she never knew what was really expected of her. It was kind of she was left to her own devices until something went wrong, and it all stemmed from a lack of clear communication. As you can imagine, that would be a hard work environment for anyone, Lack of communication in general has a whole host of issues. Why? Because you have no idea how best to submit to the authority of your supervisor if your boss or supervisor isn't communicating clear expectations. And yet, how often do we go throughout the day wondering how best to serve the Lord, but don't spend time with him in his word? How do we think that we can actually submit to the authority of Jesus but only get in the Word one day a week. Or think about only coming to church, or think that only coming to church reflects a submission to Jesus. I want to be clear here. Your salvation and your standing with God has nothing to do with your time in the Word. Your salvation with God has nothing to do with your day-to-day, but solely what you do day-to-day, but solely rest in what Christ has accomplished for you. I know that there are moms here this morning who have young children and they're running ragged trying to care for them. I know that there are some who are in a spiritual drought and a dry season right now and it feels like opening up the Bible is the hardest thing that you can ever do. I know that some are just in a season where they're working and working and working and your head down is in the, your head's down and you're just going right along and it feels like opening up the Bible is the last thing that you can do and you don't have time. I mean, I want to acknowledge the brokenness of a fallen world that makes things harder to get in the Word. I acknowledge that. But hear me on this. If we belong to God and we owe Him everything, then the best possible place we can start to know this God, to whom we owe owe our lives, is the very Word where He discloses Himself to us. If we belong to God and yet we can spend hours on our phones or watching TV or reading other books or surfing the web then one of the best ways we can render to God what is his is to spend time with him in his word. And that's exactly the point that Jesus is making to the Sadducees. They get the very doctrine of the resurrection wrong because they don't even know the scriptures of which testify to the resurrection. Look at how Jesus responds to them in verse 25. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Phenomenal what Jesus does here. He uses the scripture that they actually affirm to show them that they are wrong. In essence, he's saying, look, guys, you're making some faulty assumptions assumptions about death and about the resurrection. One of which is that you assume that death is a continuance of this life. 
It's not true. We will be like the angels, Jesus says, in that there will be no marriage in the afterlife. It has to be this way, Jesus is saying. Why? Because God will not compete for our affections. And the new heavens and the new earth, we will be in total awe of God, worshiping him all the days, all, for all eternity. And nothing will compete with that, not even an affection for our spouse. But Jesus goes further and he quotes from Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, where he says, I am the God of the Father, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Jesus uses this point to show that God is not God of the dead, but of the living. What does that exactly mean? Well, it has to do with God's covenant. This is covenant language where the living God reveals his name to Moses as the I am, the ever-present helper and deliverer of his people. So here's the logic that Jesus is using. God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, David, Moses. He made promises to his covenant people. He promised that Abraham would be a great nation and a blessing to the world and inherit a land. He promised that Moses would inherit a land. He promised that David would have an everlasting dynasty. Now, when these men died, they did not see the fulfillment of those promises. And so if these men are dead without seeing the fulfillment of God's promises, then that makes God a liar. And so Jesus shows the Sadducees that God is the God of the living, implying that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are living. And if God chooses to be identified by the names of his long-dead servants with whom his covenant was made and whom he committed himself to protect, then they cannot simply be dead and forgotten. It's utterly amazing how Jesus responds to those who seek to discredit him. This is the Jesus that we are called to submit to. And so here's the main point of what I'm getting at. A lack of Bible knowledge, a lack of knowledge of the scriptures, reflects a lack of submission to Jesus. And so we must resist every temptation to reject Jesus' authority by submitting to his authority through submission to his word. He is a God of the living and ever-present help in times of trouble, a covenant God who keeps his promises, a God who will raise this dead body back to life. That's the God who you are called to submit to. Don't reject him or rebel against his authority because you aren't in his word. And so positively, what does this look like? What are we to do day in and day out? Well, it starts with recognizing the areas where we fall short in submitting to Jesus. I mean, here is Jesus who has authority. As I mentioned earlier, he proves his authority by casting out demons, healing the sick, making paralyzed walk, stopping the storm, raising the dead to life, and forgiving sins. Jesus, the king of the universe, is in authority, and yet we share the same heart as the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees in the temptation to reject that authority. And so a question for you is, is what area in your life are you failing to submit to Jesus' authority? What are you failing to give up? It could be a political ideology. It could be a lifestyle commitment. It could be anything else. I mean, for example, I meet with a group of guys on Monday and we're currently working through what conflict resolution looks like. <clears throat> and one of the questions that I posed to them was, is there someone you are in conflict with right now that you know you need to resolve that conflict, but you haven't done it yet, or you won't do it? It's a good question for all of us, not just with conflict, but with everything. Is there something in your life that you know Jesus appro- disapproves of, and yet you still continue in it? On the other side, are there things that you believe in even though the scriptures speak clearly against it? There's much talk that we hear and use that sounds Christian and it sounds good and it sounds nice, but it couldn't be further from the truth. For example, how many of you have heard the phrase, God helps those who help themselves? Seems pretty popular. It sounds good. I'm sure a lot of us know people who we've tried to help, but they don't want any part of it, right? Right? They don't want to change their lives. They don't want to change their habits. And so helping them actually becomes enabling to them. But if we apply that same logic to God, then we miss the entire point of the gospel, right? God actually helps those who can't help themselves. 
It's the entire point of the gospel. Or tell you, for example, when people say, God says, don't judge. We hear that all the time, and maybe we even say it to ourselves. Maybe we even believe in that. But if we analyze that in light of Scripture, we see that we are actually compelled to look at the fruit of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who have fallen short of God's standards, and we're called to exhort them back and repent. We are called to judge as Christians to look at the fruit of others' lives. And so part of submitting to Jesus' authority is submitting yourself, your worldview, your beliefs, your opinions, your ideas to the authority of Scripture. There are areas that both groups in this text are failing to give up and rejecting Jesus' authority. And this morning, my question for you centers around just that. Jesus says to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. You are made in the image of God and his face is stamped upon you. And so you give him your whole life. Are you keeping an area of life from underneath the authority of Christ or are you believing in something that hasn't been examined in light of Scripture? My response is the same to both. We must be a people who cast away every temptation to reject Jesus' authority, and we must submit ourselves to the authority of Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I read a, I read a text like this, and I am amazed at the wisdom of your son Jesus. How he doesn't run away from traps, but he also doesn't discredit himself and his authority, and yet he stands victorious as the one who has all authority. So Lord, would we be a people, would we be a church who submit to the authority of our King Jesus? And individually, would we go throughout our lives with Jesus as our Lord, who has every right to tell us how we live? And so we may we live all the days of our life for now and for all eternity, praising you, praising your son, and submitting to his authority. It's in his name we pray. Amen.